We're going to tonight, uh, talk tonight about architectural sculpture on um, buildings and in, in uh, Detroit and throughout Michigan, the rest of the state. The Detroit book is just buildings within the Detroit city limits. The Michigan book is buildings, uh, like I said, throughout the state of Michigan outside the city limits of Detroit. So there's no overlap between the two books. Um, presentation will be organized by types of buildings. I will talk about uh, three or four samples, examples of different kinds of buildings, and then the last one in each category will go a little bit more in depth. Uh, please feel free to ask questions at any time. Just raise your hand. If I feel like we're getting bogged down a little bit or, or running a, a short on time, I might kind of ask you to hold questions till the end, but usually that's not a problem. I like to answer questions as they come up. So, Let's start by asking, who has seen this tiger? Just about everybody, right? If you've been to a ball game at Comerica Park, or if you uh, watch the game on TV, you've seen this, this piece of sculpture out in front of the stadium. But how many people have seen this guy? Um, he's pretty recognizable, pretty memorable. If you'd seen him, you'd probably remember. Well, the fact is, if you've been to a ball game at Comerica Park and you crossed Woodward Avenue, at the Hockey Town Cafe to walk over to the ballpark. You walked right past this guy. He's right here on St. John's Episcopal Church, which is right across Woodward from the Hockey Town Cafe. So that, in a nutshell, is a big part of what the Guardians of Detroit and Guardians of Michigan Project is all about, which is finding these pieces of architectural art, these pieces of easily overlooked art, uh, and bringing them out into the open and, and providing uh, photographs for up, up close examination of them. So we're going to start with houses of worship, beginning with St. John's Episcopal Church, uh, built in 1861 at 2326 Woodward Avenue in Detroit. As I said, it's right across the street from the Hockey Town Cafe. The architects are Albert H. Jordan and James Anderson, and the sculptor is Walter Schweikert. And if you get a chance, if you go to a ball game, uh, go a little bit early, take some time to walk around this church. There's not so much sculpture on this side because at the time the church was built, there was a church, uh, the parsonage was right there next to the building. But there's interesting sculpture on the front and around the side. And this looks kind of like a, a white stone church with dark trim. And all this dark trim is actually a kind of mustard yellow sandstone but it's just picked up so much dirt and grime over the years that it looks dark. Uh, and that makes it a little harder to find some of the sculpture on the building. But if you look at the front, especially up in this area, it's kind of like one of those hidden picture puzzles where the more you look, the longer you look, the more you see. And then if you walk around the other side along the I-75 service drive, there's a sidewalk, uh, a ton of sculpture on that side. Really fun to see, uh, fun to look at. Now we're going up to Bay City. And this is uh, another uh, illustration of um, how I had to do work to do the Guardians project, which is uh, going to each town to look around and see what they have. Uh, I can do a lot of research on the internet and through books, find out about a lot of buildings, but there's no substitute for being there. I didn't know about this church. I knew about the Bay County building. I knew about the Masonic Temple there in Bay City. As a matter of fact, I was at the Masonic Temple, and I happened to look down the street and across the, the street, and I saw this church, and I thought, well, this looks like the kind of church that might have some interesting sculpture on it. And then I got up close, and it did. It had all this beautiful stuff on it. You have these guardian figures here. You have... Uh, more here, most of this is from around the entrance, some of that's further up. And then here, these are right by the door, these figures with these lion heads uh, on top of them. And that's an expression of the, um, the Christian belief that the word of God comes forth from his followers like a mighty roar. So that's another thing we're going to talk about tonight, it is a little bit about the symbolism, what these, why the sculpture is on the building, what it stands for, what it means. Now we're back in Detroit. This is Fort Street Presbyterian Church. This was built in 1855 at 631 West Fort Street in Detroit. Uh, the architects are Albert H. Jordan and James Anderson. The sculptor is unknown. And this is another 
uh, example of what I'm doing with the, the Guardians of Detroit Guardians of Michigan Project, which these five pieces here are all on the, the west side of the building, easy to see. And I thought, as I was taking these pictures, that there must be sculpture on the east side of the building as well. But you can't tell because they built what they call a church house, which is like a community center right next door to the church of um, 20 years or so, uh, maybe a little bit more after the church was built. So I called them up and asked, is there sculpture on that side of the building? And they said, yes, there is, but you can't see it unless you go inside the church house. And so I got permission to do that, went into the church house, go up to the second floor, look out the window, and you can see a couple of these guys here, but you can't see them all unless you climb out the window onto the roof and walk around, and then you can see some more. But to see all of them, you have to go to one end, to the um, uh, south end of the, the roof, and then there's a wall with a steel ladder bolted into it. And you climb up that ladder, and you can see the last couple pieces. And a smart person would have done this in the summertime. I did it in the winter. It's kind of cold and icy, but it was well worth doing it, because again, uh, I get to bring these faces uh, out into the open that most people very few people have had the chance to see for over 100 years. Now we're going up to Marquette. This is St. Peter Cathedral in Marquette, built in 1890 and 1938 at 311 Barraga Street in Marquette. Uh, architects are Henry C. Coke and Son for 1890 and Edward A. Schilling for 1938. And the sculptor is Corrado Parducci. And you're going to hear that name uh, quite a bit as we go along tonight, and I'll talk about him a little bit more in a bit. So the reason there's two dates for this building was that there was a fire in 1935 that destroyed most of the building and left only the sandstone walls standing. These, um, sand, this is all sandstone from uh, the UP, from that area, all native Michigan sandstone that church was built with. So they rebuilt in 1938. There used to, they made it bigger and better. There used to be a round rose window here, but they put this much taller uh, triforet arch uh, window in there with some sculpture here. And then you can see sculpture up here. They added onto the towers, made them taller, and then put those colorful domes on top as well. So here's a closer look at the, some of the sculpture on the building. Here in the, the archway, you can see statues of St. Peter and St. Paul. We know who they are because it says St. Peter and St. Paul right underneath, but even if it didn't, we would know who they were because you, you see them on a lot of Catholic churches, St. Peter and St. Paul on the outside of the church. Uh, St. Peter is almost always on the left, St. Paul on the right. St. Peter is usually holding the keys to the kingdom and St. Paul holding a sword. And then here's a closer look at one of the angels on the tower and you can see that the wings were painted gold, which was a, another thing that they used to do with sculpture from this era is paint it, um, add gold to it and sometimes even put gold leaf uh, gilding the, the stone to make it nice and shiny. Now we're uh, looking at another house of worship but it's not a church. It's the Pashima Kasi Sri Vishwanath Temple, built in 2015 at 1147 South Elms Road in Flint. And the architect and sculptor are unknown, but they were, it was, uh, the sculpture was done and the building was designed based on uh, traditional guidelines from ancient Hindu texts. And you have this tower here called a Gopuram, with all these niches for deities in it. And there's 126 different deities on the tower. There's deities on all four sides. And this is a, a Shavas temple where there's different sects to Buddhism, different, or excuse me, Hinduism, different types of Hinduism. This is a Shavas temple where they worship Shiva as the, the main god, as the one a ruling god. And we would look at this and think of this as a polytheistic religion with all these different deities on the building. But to them, these, uh, these deities are all uh, aspects or avatars of Shiva. Uh, sent to earth to perform a, a, a certain mission or a certain job or to be there for a certain purpose. So in, in some ways it's still a monotheistic religion. And now we've come back down um, to uh, Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. This is Christ Church Cranbrook, built in 1929 at 470 Church Road in Bloomfield Hills. And the architects 
Oscar H. Murray of Bertram Grossman or Godhue Associates. They were a, a firm that specialized in churches, uh, especially along the East Coast and out into the Midwest. Um, George Booth was uh, married a woman named Ellen Scripps. Ellen Scripps was the daughter of the Detroit News founder, James Scripps. And George Booth succeeded him as publisher of the Detroit News. And then he also built a chain of newspapers around the Midwest and another chain of newspapers throughout Michigan. So he and Ellen were two of the richest people in the Detroit area. And they had the goal of giving away their fortune to use it to do good works. They founded Cranbrook uh, Educational Community, and then they also paid, uh, donated the land from their estate and paid to build this church on that property. The sculpture on the building is done by Lee Lowry and um, Ulrich Ellerhausen. That's Lee on the left and Ulrich Ellerhausen on the right. Lee Lowry was born with the name Hugo Belling in 1877 in Rixdorf, Prussia. Came to America in 1881 with his mother, and she married a man named Charles Lowry. So Hugo eventually changed his name to Lee Lowry so he would have a more American-sounding name. He worked as a sculptor from the time he was 12 years old as an apprentice uh, until his death in 1963 and responsible for over 300 commissions across the United States. Uh, his masterwork is probably the Nebraska State Capitol, which has a very nice program of sculpture, multiple sculpture on the outside of the building. And then uh, Ulrich Ellerhausen was born in Germany in 1879 and came to the U.S. in 1894. And he studied under Laredo Taft, who was one of the more popular American sculptors of the time, and he also studied under Gutzon Borglum. Does anybody know who that is? The man behind Mount Rushmore studied with him, and he also studied with Carl Bitter, who is a very well-known uh, architectural sculptor uh, in uh, um, Ohio and New York. So they sculpted these figures on the outside of the building, 18 figures on the church that were known as the Dawn Men, selected by church leadership because they brought the light of truth to the world. So these are all from the north side of the church, and they were all selected uh, because of their religious beliefs. Uh, they advanced religious beliefs and principles. So this is uh, Phillips Brooks, a theologian, wrote the hymn, uh, Christmas Carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem. It's Abraham Lincoln here, William Penn, founder of the Pennsylvania Colony, uh, helped write the Constitution. This is John Wycliffe the uh, first man to translate the Bible into English, so you can see him holding his Bible here, his English Bible. And then this is Thomas Cranmer, who was a leader of the Protestant, Revo uh, Rest Protestant Reformation in the 1500s. And then on the south side of the church, they have something kind of unusual for a church, which is they have these secular figures on that side of the church. To go back, they're all right along here. And they were chosen because they advanced uh, scientific knowledge in the um, face of persecution from religious and secular forces. So we start here with Wilbur Wright holding a propeller. <laughs> and then we have the ultimate Renaissance man, Leonardo da Vinci. And then we have Galileo, who was persecuted by the Inquisition for um, declaring that the earth revolved around the sun. So a lot of times when you see him, you see him holding his model of the solar system, showing the earth revolving around the sun, and you also see him holding a telescope. He did not invent the telescope, but he refined it and made some interesting disco uh, discoveries about planets in our solar system using it. And then on the Campanile, the bell tower, there's these nice uh, animal head figures representing native Michigan animals. I really like this kind of angry looking rabbit up at the top. And then this is the only building I know of that has a fish, a portrait of a fish on the outside of it. And I kind of like that, that fish there. So now we've looked at religious uh, buildings and we're moving on to newspaper buildings. And these are all buildings, newspaper buildings that were designed by Albert Kahn. Most of them for George Booth's uh, chain of newspapers across Michigan. But we're starting here with the Detroit News. 
And uh, this building was built in 1917 at 615 West Lafayette Boulevard in Detroit. The, uh, as I said, the architect's Albert Kahn. And the sculpture on the building is attributed to Alessio Ricci and his partner at the time, John Donnelly. So there's this, these great cartouches up at the corner and then some statues representing men involved with the history of printing. And then these spaces between the windows are called spandrels. And on those spandrels, there's various uh, printer's marks of various printers. So here's a, a look at the uh, cartouche up at the corner. There's eight of these, all the same, on the building, two at every corner. At the top, you have the owl representing knowledge and wisdom. And then on the shield, you have an American eagle holding the Constitution, representing freedom of the press. And then you have these printer's marks, which are like logos that, uh, for the printers. They had to be registered with the king or the prince or the ruler of the country or the city-state or the state that they lived in. You had to have permission from the ruler to print anything. And you had to have your printer's mark registered to show that and then use that in your printed pieces to show that you had permission uh, to be able to be publishing these books. And a lot of times these printer's marks were based on plays on words, like um, this is the printer's mark of Christopher Froschover. Froschover in Ger German means frog over. So you have the man sitting on the frog there. And then the two little frogs on either side represent his two sons who were in the business with him. And then down here we have the printer's mark of Aldous Minutius. His slogan was make haste carefully or make haste slowly. So you have the swift swimming dolphin wrapped around the anchor. And then uh, at the far side you have Johannes Gutenberg, the first European to uh, use the, the printing press and movable type in Europe. This building is now home to um, Quicken Loans offices. It's no longer a newspaper building. Now we're in Flint at the Flint Journal building. You can see it says Michigan State University. This is now home to the Michigan State University School of Internal Medicine. And you have some very nice pieces of work here over the windows. And then again in the spandrels you have printer's marks. So these pieces over the windows represent the history of transmitting uh, information through print. You have a, a woman carving hieroglyphics into the walls. You have a, a man working with movable type, setting type. Uh, another man working on an uh, engraving or an etching because at one time you couldn't, you know, they didn't have photographic processes for printing pictures in the newspaper. Everything had to be turned into line art. So that's what he's doing. And then you have a woman working, uh, writing on a scroll with pen and ink with a quill pen. And then here's some more um, printer's marks. And these are kind of more cryptic with uh, more based on initials than um, puns and wordplay. Now we're looking at the Jackson Citizen Patriot Building in Jackson, Michigan. And this was built in 1927 at 214 South Jackson Street. Architects Albert Kahn again. All of these newspaper buildings designed by Albert Kahn. And the sculptor is Corrado Parducci. So it's called the Jackson Citizen Patriot because one of the things that Booth would do was go into a town and he would buy the, the most popular, the strongest newspaper business in the town. And if there was more than one that were both popular and strong, he'd buy both of them and merge them because he felt that the competition in the newspaper industry, not only was it bad for him, bad for business, but he said that it was bad for the populace. It only served to upset and confuse the populace and, and the people. And as long as someone like himself who could be trusted to be fair and impartial when reporting the news was in charge, uh, what could go wrong, right? So you see up here uh, cartouche. We're going to take a closer look at that. And then these figures on either end. This is the State Seal of Michigan, surrounded by protective uh, grotesques, and then owls on either side representing wisdom. And you can see that's also on the cover of the Guardians of Michigan book. And then you have, from either end of the building, uh, a figure writing on a scroll with a pen representing the people that do the intellectual work of writing and reporting and editing the news. And then you have a man with a mortar and pestle for grinding ink representing the people that do the physical labor of printing and distributing the newspapers. 
And if you're wondering why there's Egyptian figures on a Midwestern newspaper building, it's because in uh, 1922, Howard Carter had discovered King Tut's tomb. So there was a big craze in America, uh, Europe and America, uh, for everything Egyptian. So this was a very stylish choice for this building. And that's now an apartment building, by the way. And now we're up in Muskegon, and this is the Muskegon Chronicle building. And you, you can see, again, uh, designed by Overcon, um, sculptor by Corrado produced, sculpture by Corrado Parducci. And you can see, all designed by the same person, but now we've been looking at buildings in chronological order. They all have kind of a Romanesque feel to them, but as we advance, they're getting more modern looking, uh, more streamlined. Now this building is now part of Muskegon Community College, but it has these great uh, printer's marks. Again, you can see they're a little more elaborate, a little more interesting looking from the Northern Italian Renaissance. And this uh, group of printer's marks also illustrates one of the problems with doing research, one of the difficulties with doing research about these buildings, because I have a lot of print and uh, online resources for finding who's, uh, who, rep who these printer's marks represent, but I could not find these two. I could find ones that had symbol similar symbolism on them, but they all had different letters. And then when I read a newspaper report published in the Muskegon Chronicle after the building was opened, uh, it explained who all these printer's marks uh, were representing and that these two, they had changed the letters to MC to represent Muskegon Chronicle. So one of the, the tricky parts about doing research for this type of building. And now we're in Ann Arbor looking at the Ann Arbor News Building. It's now the University of Michigan Credit Union. Uh, you can, and again, sculptures by Corrado Parducci designed by Cod, and you can see it's a much more modern and sleeker looking building with a very light um, limestone, uh, sort of representing pillars with sort of representing fluting, but much more modern in these dark granite spandrels between the windows with aluminum. You see that's aluminum up here at the top, and then aluminum sculpture in the spandrels uh, by Parducci representing all the different types of uh, jobs and functions and um, things needed to produce a newspaper. So we're going to take a little step back in time now and look at the Kalamazoo Gazette building, which was built in 1925, not quite as modern as the last two buildings we looked at. This is at 401 South Burdick Street in Kalamazoo, and the sculptor again is Corrado Parducci. And um, one of the things you notice on this building is these two big figures. This is something that an architect would put on a building major sculpture on a set, uh, part of the building to help define where the entrance was so that pedestrians would know where to go to come to find the door into the building. And you can see there's no door here, just windows. And that's because about 20 or 30 years after it was built, the building was expanded and added onto, and the entrance was moved around the side. But they left these figures here uh, in place. So there's a closer look. On the far side there is a woman holding a pen and a book representing recording of history, recording of the news. And then on this side, a woman holding an hourglass representing the passage of time. And then you have these gargoyles here from uh, near the roof line, which uh, adds some layer of spiritual protection to the building. And then more printer's marks, again with the play on words. This is the printer's mark of Christopher Miller. So you have a windmill. And then this is the printer's mark of Andrea Alciato with uh, his slogan must have been make haste quickly because he has the swift swimming dolphin wrapped around the fast moving arrow. And then this building also has something interesting on it which is these uh, kind of unique animal allegorical reliefs representing the newspaper's role in society. So here up, up here in the corner you see what's called a caduceus which we kind of look at and think of that as a medical symbol, but it's actually, actually the staff of the Roman god Mercury. And it's, uh, he was the, not only the messenger god, but he was also the god of commerce. So when you see that symbol on a building, it represents commerce. And then you have this kind of uh, evil looking wolf in the same relief, and this represents the newspaper's role to protect its readers from unscrupulous businessmen and unscrupulous business practices. 
and then you have an owl fighting with a snake representing the triumph of knowledge over the treachery of ignorance. You have a lion guarding the uh, lamp of knowledge, and then you have a wolverine with a fish in its mouth representing the newspaper's role to help safeguard Michigan's natural resources. So now we're going to go from newspaper buildings to skyscraper bank buildings. And this is the second national bank in Saginaw, Michigan, built in 1925 at 101 North Washington Street. The architects Wirt C. Rowland, and the sculptor again is Corrado Parducci. There's that name again. Uh, we'll get to him in, in a little bit. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about Wirt C. Rowland first. Uh, I think of him as Detroit's other great architect. Everybody knows Albert Kahn. Everybody's heard of Albert Kahn, and rightly so. But uh, Wirt C. Rowland also designed quite a few uh, iconic buildings around the Detroit area. He's responsible for the Buell Building, the Penobscot Building, the Guardian Building, which we'll look at in a minute, all designed by Wirt C. Rowland. You look at this building, and you can see the walls have kind of a shine to them. They seem kind of shiny and smooth, and that's because that's not stone on the outside of the building. This was a fairly new building material for the time for use on skyscrapers, and that's uh, terracotta. This is all glazed terracotta, and it's uh, glazed with a textured glaze to make it look a little bit more like stone. Terracotta had the advantage of being less expensive and also easier to clean and maintain than stone. And this piece of work here, this very intricate piece of sculpture, shows another advantage of working with terracotta in that these, didn't need, these figures didn't need to be carved. They could all be molded. The sculptor would create um, a figure out of clay, cast it in plaster, and then they would um, mold it. And these figures here, this is from up at the corner, they run all the way along the corners of the building, these little guys, and these, line, these eagle heads in between. And if you're wondering, one of the questions I get asked a lot is, why do they put such interesting sculpture way up high at the top of these buildings where it's really hard to see? And the answer to that question is because it was a, a transitional time in architecture. And all these architects working at this time, they were mostly trained in European styles and European traditions of architecture. And then they're combining their training to, to, uh, with the very American concept of the skyscraper building. So their training called for them to put ornamentation up at the top of the building even though now with the skyscraper, it's 13 stories up and very hard to see from ground level. So here's a closer look at some of the sculpture on the building. You have kings representing the wealth and power of ancient kingdoms. You have griffins who were guardians, mythological guardians of treasure. Uh, over the doorway, you have the shield from the state seal of Michigan with Tubor, meaning I will defend with the fish on either side, again, uh, referencing Michigan's natural resources. And then you see the caduceus here, so you know this figure represents mercury, represents commerce. And then we have uh, one of the protective animals. There's a series of protective animals in the archway over the doorway. So I told you we'd talk about the Guardian Building. This is the Guardian Building in downtown Detroit. Uh, built in 1929 at 500 Griswold Street. The architect is Wirt C. Rowland, and the sculptor is Corrado Parducci. And this is Corrado Parducci in a closer look at one of the Guardian figures on the outside of the building. Corrado Parducci was um, extremely hardworking and prolific. He came to Detroit in 1924 to oversee sculpture on a building that he had modeled sculpture for. Uh, Albert Kahn brought him in. The, this work was being done in the middle of winter. Uh, Parducci, being a young man, was uh, the guy he chose to go up on the, the scaffolding and super, supervise the stone carvers. Uh, the way that Parducci worked, and a lot of the architectural sculptors worked at this time, was very few of them actually carved in stone or sculpted in stone. Parducci would make a clay uh, model about this big to show to the architect to make sure it suited what the architect wanted to do, and then he would make a life-size or full-size um, sculpture out of clay, and then that would be cast in plaster, and the plaster cast would be taken to the stone yard or, or to the building where stone cutters would actually do the work of carving it out of stone. 
I want to mention, too, that Roland saw this building as a, a cathedral of finance. And part of that was because he envisioned and hired an army of craftsmen to work on the building. Uh, there's poetic pottery tile on the outside. There's all kinds of painting in murals and stained glass and uh, craft work on the inside. If you get a chance, go down to Detroit, um, take a walk and take a look inside this building. There's also a place inside called Pure Detroit that gives tours of the building, but very beautiful building to see inside. And then another um, more subtle way that it's a cathedral of finance. Remember we, on the uh, Cathedral in Marquette, we talked about St. Peter and St. Paul uh, holding the, the key and the sword. So even though they're not actually representations of St. Peter and St. Paul, they're you know, Aztec, Mayan-influenced guardians, they still give that impression. Um, Parducci was born in Italy in 1900 in a town called Budi, which is just a little bit north of Pisa. And he came to New York City in uh, 1904. And his artistic talent was recognized at a, at a very early age. And he studied with some of, in some of the best art schools in New York City, and then eventually apprenticed with Ulysses Ritchie. Uh, and as I said, came to Detroit in 1924. And while he was here supervising that work, he was so well known for how quickly he worked and how well trained he was and how knowledgeable he was in different styles of sculpture that he got offers of work from all the different major architectural firms in the city. And he never went back to New York. He bought out his contract. Uh, sent for his wife, didn't even have time to go back and get his wife because he had so much work coming in, uh, and, and opened a studio in Detroit, worked six or seven days a week, typically slept at his studio during the week, only saw his family on Sundays. Uh, he, these are sculptures he made of his three sons. And then this is a closer look at that half dome, the Puabic pottery uh, work in the middle of it. Um, this was such a big project for them that they did not have room inside the Puabic Pottery Building to assemble this thing as they put it together. So what they did was they dug a big round hole in the front yard and put a tent over it. And as the tiles were finished, they were brought out and assembled in this hole, put into place so that they could make sure everything fit properly and worked. And then they brought it all to the building and put it on in place. So you have this figure here that represents an aviator representing progress and, and modernness. And then you have these medallions at the bottom representing industry, uh, agriculture, and transportation. Now we're in Pontiac. And uh, this is the house that Junk built, uh, known as the People's State Bank when it was built in 1929. 28 North Saginaw Street in Pontiac. The architects, the J.W. Cook Company. Sculptors unknown. And it was called the house that Junk built because it was built by a man named Jacob Kavinsky. He was a Polish immigrant who came to North America with his family in 1894. and came to Pontiac around 1900 when he was um, about 17 or 18 years old with a, a wagon, a blind horse, and $231 in his pocket. And he started a business dealing with uh, old rags and hides and um, old metals, iron and steel. And he built a salvage business out of that, that so, so strong that by 1918, he was a millionaire. And he helped found People's State Bank in 1922, and then in 1929, uh, financed the construction of this building. He saw that as his crowning achievement. Here up at the very top, you have these figures that are kind of an interesting conglomeration of Native American dress from North America, South America, Central America, all kind of rolled into one. You have a flock of 16 eagles guarding the building from up at the top, representing the United States. And then here, over the entrance, you have this portrait of Chief Pontiac. And now we're in Battle Creek, and we're looking at the old merchant's tower uh, now known as the Milton, built in 1931 at 25 West Michigan Avenue in Battle Creek. The architect's Weary and Alfred Company, and the sculptor is unknown. Um, this building is, uh, was the first bank building in the United States. 
to feature an automatic stair climber. Does anybody know what that is? An, an escalator. Uh, Weary and Alford pioneered something new with bank buildings. They were building these office towers with a bank on the ground floor and an office space above that they rented out to various professionals. And besides the uh, bank on the ground floor, they would rent the ground floor space out for retail business. Well, Weary and Alfred realized that you could put the banking floor up on the second floor, and then you could rent the whole ground floor area out to, for retail business and help make more money uh, for the owners, which in this case, or most cases, would be the bank. And so they put the escalator, the automatic stair climber in, to help their patrons reach the second floor more easily. Weary and Alfred buildings feature this kind of unique type of architectural sculpture on them, where they combined incised work where the lines are carved into the stone with relief work where uh, images are raised out of the stone. So you can see that here. If you see this type of work on a building in Michigan, a lot of the time that will be a Weary and Alford design building. And now we're looking at uh, a bank in Lansing. You can see it says Comerica up at the top, but originally it was the City National Bank. Uh, built in 1932 at 101 North Washington Square in Lansing. The architects are Lee and Kenneth Black with York and Sawyer. And the sculptor is this man here, Ulysses Ritchie. Um, he was born in 1888 to an Italian immigrant family living in New York. And he was a sculptor his entire life. He told a newspaper reporter that he remembered holding clay in his hand and sculpting when he was just six years old. Uh, claimed to come from a line of Italian sculptors and ceramicists that went back hundreds of years uh, back in Italy. And when he was 11 years old, he was um, accepted at the Drexel Institute in Pennsylvania based on samples that he sent them. But then when he got there to Drexel, he was told, you know, you're only 11 years old, you're too young to go to our school, go back home, which he did. And he became the apprentice. He, he worked with his uncle, Alessio Ritchie, apprenticed with his uncle at Perth Amboy Terracotta Works in New Jersey, and then eventually had his own studio. Uh, Corrado Parducci was one of his apprentices at one time. So you can see all these, a lot of these sculptors uh, connect in different ways. So this building has a, it's a Romanesque building, Romanesque design building applied to a skyscraper form. You can tell it's Romanesque because of the rounded arches. And it's um, got an interesting program of sculpture on it representing the, what goes on in the building and uh, representing the city of Lansing. So here, for example, is sculpture on the one side of the building representing American coins, American money, where you have the Liberty dime and the, or, or the Mercury dime and the Liberty quarter or dollar, and then you have the eagle. And then on some of the windows, you have these very interesting corbels in the corners where they're kind of opposites. On, in this case, that's a dentist representing the people that uh, rent office space from the bank. You can see he's holding a pair of pliers in one hand. And then uh, on the other hand, on the other side of the window, there's a patient with a bandage wrapped around his head and a swollen cheek. There's another window that has a, um, uh, police officer on one side and a bank robber on the other side. It's kind of fun stuff on the building. And then this is a representation of the uh, protective Egyptian goddess Bastet, some of the sculpture near the doorway. And then here we have uh, a seahorse. And why is there a seahorse on a bank building? Uh, this is fairly big. It's a flagpole holder, held a 30-foot long flagpole. Seahorses represent a good fortune and power. So it's a good thing to have on a bank. Uh, and then you have the elephants on either side of the doorway, elephants representing strength and stability. And the bank actually used the symbol of the elephant on its letterhead for a while. You have a man holding the Capitol Dome, representing Lansing's role as the state capital of Michigan. And then here you have uh, kind of an inter interesting animal. It's, uh, it's a wolverine carved by somebody who had never seen a wolverine holding some kind of animal in its mouth, representing Michigan's natural resources. And then you have inside the archway, looking straight up, this man representing the law with bulls on either side, representing a profitable stock market. Uh, you have a merchant or a doctor here 
holding a thermometer, uh, a merchant holding a cash register, and then over the employee's entrance, you have these dragon figures uh, warding off uh, evil spirits and um, bad employees. Uh, and the good employees can come in, I guess. So now we're done with bank buildings, but we're going to stay in Lansing and start looking at some school buildings. And this is the J.W. Sexton High School building, built in 1943 at 102 McPherson Street in Lansing. The architect's Warren S. Holmes Company. Sculptor, again, is Corrado Parducci. As a matter of fact, like I said, this was built in 1943. This was one of the last really elaborate um, commissions that Parducci had because styles were changing. You see this has kind of an Art Deco feel, a more modern feel to it. And uh, building styles after the, the 1940s, and especially after World War II, very rarely called for any kind of architectural sculpture on them. These are some reliefs from around the doorway. You have students engaged in athletic pursuits, and then other students engaged in academic pursuits. And then on the outside of the auditorium, you have these students uh, performing. Really nice piece of work there. Now we're going all the way up to the Upper Peninsula, almost as far west as you can go in the Upper Peninsula without being in Wisconsin. This is from the town of Wakefield. This is the Wakefield High School Gymnasium, built in 1932 at 715 Putnam Street in Wakefield. And the architects are the Warren S. Holmes Company with N.A. Nelson, and the sculptor is unknown. And here's a closer look at some of the, this nice triptych piece of sculpture over the entrance where you have uh, representations of the kind of activities young people engaged in the kind of activities that would go on in a gymnasium where old guys like me uh, sit in the corner and read books while all that's going on. This is kind of an interesting style of sculpture that you see on several different school buildings across the uh, UP, all designed by the same company. I don't know who the sculptor is, I wasn't able to find that out, so I don't know if it's the same sculptor or it was just the way the architect designed it, but we have these pieces here from Antonagin and Ishpeming and Nagani. And you can see there's some variation between them, even this one here where you have the chemistry student, the same thing, same theme up here, slightly different, but very similar. Now we're down in Detroit and we're looking at Old Main, the Old Main building on Wayne State University campus, which was built in uh, 19, or 1896 as Detroit Central High School, uh, 481, 4841 Cass Avenue in Detroit. The architects Malcolmson and Higginbottom, and the sculptor was Albert, Alfred E. Nygaard. So you have a sculpture concentrated around the entrance. You can see this band of sculpture here that has portraits, uh, 10 different portraits of uh, historical figures. There's a closer look at two of them, Goethe on one side and Galileo, a little bit different interpretation of Galileo. You have owls at the corners, they kind of wrap around the corners, representing knowledge and learning. Uh, some figures from near the entrance, and then one of the, the neat things about this building is on the south side, the south entrance, there's a, a young man and a young woman, like a, a, a teenagers on the one side, and then on the north side of the building, there's the mature man and woman. So it represents how you grow and mature as you will go through the halls of the high school and uh, learn and become, hopefully become an adult by the time you're ready to graduate. Now we're looking at the Olin Memorial Health Center, uh, not a school building per se, but on the campus at Michigan State University. It um, was built in 1939 at 463 East Circle Drive in East Lansing. And then here, uh, smoking a cigarette, is the man that did the sculpture for the health center, uh, Samuel Cashwan. So on either side of the door, we have these reliefs representing uh, the history of medicine. And then up here on either side of the uh, nameplate of the building is the Greek goddess Panacea, the goddess of medicinal cures. And then on this side, Hygieia, the goddess of uh, uh, cleanliness and good health. Here's a closer look at some of the sculpture on the building. Um, we have magical cures, uh, herbal remedies, uh, diagnosis where people meet to discuss and figure out what's wrong with their patient. And then a little more modern, we have the x-ray. 
And this is uh, some of those, what those panels look like um, uh, on the inner side of the doorway. And then this is a clo little closer look at Hygeia. Now we go from Michigan State to the University of Michigan. And this is the law quad at the University of Michigan. Uh, it took 10 years to build all these buildings. Um, from 1923 to 1933, it's located at 625 State Street. The architect's York and Sawyer. The sculptors are Ulysses Ritchie and his partner at that time, Angelo Zari. So this is a, a massive complex of four interconnected buildings. You have the Lawyers Club, which is actually three buildings, the, the Lawyers Club itself and the dining hall, and then the uh, Lawyers Club dormitory. This is the, uh, and then you have the William P. Cook dormitory, and you have the James Cook, do I have those names right? Oh, the John P. Cook Dormitory and the William P. Cook uh, Legal Library, which this is from that, and it's all designed in the collegiate Gothic style, which was, you know, the, these brand new school buildings get an air of instant history to them by mimicking a style of building that is used for a lot of European schools and universities. And then this is the tower in the middle of the Lawyers Club Dormitory, which uh, has three different archways through the middle from South University Street into the Law Quad. This was all um, paid for and overseen by a man named William W. Cook, who was a prominent 1882 graduate of the University of Michigan Law School. And he wanted, um, he made a lot of money as a corporate lawyer and investments and as an author on corporate law. And he paid to build all these buildings and he wanted the, um, the law students at Michigan to have the best possible buildings to, to live in and to get their education in. So all these pieces here are from Hutchins Hall, except for this one, or excuse me, these are from the uh, Lawyers Club Dining Hall, except for this one, which is from Hutchins Hall. Uh, these are from the towers of the Lawyers Club Dining Room. Again, has kind of a, a cathedral look to it. These are all from the John P. Cook dormitory. You see all these different faces, all these different expressions representing the different feelings you'll experience as you go through classes at the University of Michigan and then hopefully uh, happy and satisfied as a graduate uh, at the end of your time there. These are from the east entrance from, the, from South University into the Law Quad and uh, one of the Gothic traditions would be to represent the different seasons. So we have sports figures with the baseball player representing spring, the tennis player representing summer, and the football player representing fall. There's also agricultural figures. This is one of those uh, representing fall with the grape harvest. And then another uh, Gothic tradition would be to memorialize the people that made the building possible. So you have a surveyor, uh, a draftsman, and an architect. And then in the central tower, you have the first six presidents of the university, portraits of the first six presidents of the University of Michigan. And then in the west entrance, you have these figures all representing different types of law. This is a navigator for maritime law, uh, an engineer for patent law, a soldier for military law, and a doctor for medical law. So now we're going from school buildings to county courthouses. It's a very classic type of county courthouse. This is the Lenaway County Courthouse, built in 1885 at 309 North Main Street in Adrian. The architect's Edward O. Fallis, sculptor's unknown. Um, one of the things that uh, landowners would do is they would buy a, a lot of land in a town and then they would donate a central, centrally located piece of land for the county to build their courthouse on. So that would make all their land that they owned around that area uh, much more valuable. And traditionally, uh, a lot of the courthouses in Michigan, the old courthouses from the turn of the century, they're these big blocky style of building uh, put down in the middle of its own city block with nice landscaped grounds around it. You can see there's this very nice ter red terracotta sculpture on the outside of the building. This features Chief Tecumseh, a Native American leader, very well-respected Native American leader, the first 
city in the Lenawee County was named Tecumseh after him. This is Ceres, the Roman goddess of the harvest, uh, a protective Medusa figure. And then over the doorways you have uh, the symbols of war, the tools of war, and the tools of peace. It's another one of the same type of courthouse. This is the Hillsdale County Courthouse, uh, built a little bit later, built in 1899, 14 years later, at 29 North Howell Street in Hillsdale. The architect's Claire Allen. It's made with this kind of yellowish sandstone on the outside of the building. And here's a closer look at some of the sculpture on that building. Uh, one of the common things to do for sculpture on buildings around that time was to emulate the Statue of Liberty. You have a green man, which is a symbol of the harvest and a symbol of fertility and growth. And then you have this guy with the winged helmet representing mercury and commerce. And then you also have figures on the outside of the building representing people of different ages that would have cause to come to the courthouse and use the courthouse. So we've seen two very traditional courthouses now we see something completely different, much more modern. This is the Macomb County building, built in 1933 at 10 North Main Street in Mount Clemens. The architect is George J. Haas. The sculptor is a man named Louis A. Seeloff. And this is often referred to as the Mount Rushmore of Mount Clemens. Um, you can see up at the top, you have these 13 and a half foot tall heads of military figures all the way around on all four walls of the building. This is a closer look at one of them. This is a, an officer from the War of 1812. Macomb County is named after Alexander Macomb, who was an officer during the War of 1812 and a hero of that war. And then along with American military figures, you also have a Native American warrior on the outside of the building. And then down near the door, you have these nice um, representations of justice and of a clerk showing again the, uh, what goes on inside the building. And now, a completely different style of courtroom. This is the Midland County Courthouse, uh, built in Midland, Michigan in 1933. It's at 10 North Main Street. Excuse me, I'm looking at the wrong figures. This is built in 1926 at 301 West Main Street in Midland. The architect's Bloodgood Tuttle. And the murals on the outside of the building by, are by a man named Paul Honore. So, uh, the voters had voted to build a new courthouse in Midland, but they didn't have the money. They were having a hard time raising the money to build the courthouse. So Herbert Dow, the founder of Dow Chemical, he donated money to, uh, to help build the courthouse on the condition that he have control over the design and construction of the courthouse. So he chose a man named Paul Honore to design the courthouse, and rather than the traditional style of courthouse that we might think of, he built this, this structure that looks more like an English manor house than a Midwest uh, county courthouse. Here over the main entrance, you have this cartouche featuring the seal of the county of Midland with a, a tree representing the lumber industry, a cornucopia representing agriculture, and then a well for extracting chemicals from the ground representing the chemical industry, which was really the, the basis for most of the jobs in Midland at that time. And uh, in many cases still is. But you can also see this stucco work on the outside of the building. This was done with magne a material called magnesite stucco that was specially developed at Dow Labs for this building. A very um, hard drying substance, but it was clear it had no color to it. So the um, muralist, Paul Honore, he added ground up uh, beads of glass to the stucco to pro provide the color. So the color is locked into the glass. So these murals, they, all the work was kind of, it's kind of a sculptor, sculpturally relief kind of feel. It's kind of stretching it to think of it as architectural sculpture, but it's applied with a, a palette knife. So it has texture, it has raised texture and feel to it. And these murals are 100 years old, almost 100 years old, and the color hasn't faded at all because of this technique that they used on this building. So we're getting close to the end. Um, done looking at different categories of building, and now we're just gonna take a quick look at some of my favorite buildings that uh, didn't fit really into any of the categories that we've looked at so far, starting with the Maccabees building, which is in uh, downtown Detroit. It's on Woodward Avenue across the street and just south of the DIA. 
built in 1927, uh, 5057 Woodward Avenue. The architect is Albert Kahn, and the sculptor is Corrado Parducci. So the Maccabees were like a, a social club, a, um, a brotherhood, a, kin, a, kin, a fraternal organization akin to like the uh, Masonics, the Masons, or the Elks. This was a time when those kind of organizations really thrived. And their traditions and um, ceremonies were based on the story of Judah Maccabee, who was, uh, led a Judean revolt against the Seleucid Empire in 167 BC. And he was the first general to require that his um, soldiers set aside part of their spoils to help provide for their fa the families of their fallen comrades. So one of the things that members of the Maccabees did, they paid yearly dues that were then used to provide a um, $1,000 death benefit to the family of anyone that was a member. So all the sculpture on the outside of the building has kind of a militaristic feel to it. If we look here over the entrance, uh, here in the archway above, you have cavalry soldiers riding into battle. Uh, there on either side are medallions featuring uh, guardian soldiers in armor. And then even in the entrance, you have these men in armor. And then on either side of the doorway, you have these figures representing Judah Maccabee and his brothers and his father. Here's a closer look at some of them. They're all about this tall. And it's just one of the things I really like about this building is the, uh, the detail in the work. I think this is some of uh, Parducci's finest work in the Detroit area. But there's so much sculpture on the building, this uh, copper grate over the doorway. And then you have this portico up above the entrance with all this great sculpture on it. And then again, more protective figures uh, all around the outside of the building. The man um, carefully guarding the skyscraper of the building, another man with a bow and arrow defending the building, a man with a sword guarding the vault. So a lot of, lot of interesting sculpture on that building. Uh, now we've moved on uh, to Grand Rapids. And this is a Michigan Bell Central Office Building built in 1925 at 114 Division Avenue Northeast in Grand Rapids. And the sculptor is Wurt C. Rowland, or the architect is Wurt C. Rowland, and the sculpture on the building is attributed to Ulysses Ritchie. So Michigan Mabel expanded throughout Michigan quite rapidly throughout the 1920s, and every medium-sized and larger town had to have its own central office building to house Michigan Bell offices and their switching equipment. And uh, Mr. Rowland the, was the man that was chosen to design most of these buildings, and he didn't take a cookie-cutter approach where every town has the same Michigan and Bell office building in it. He tried to design a building that fit into the neighborhood. So across the street from where this building is built is a, a Romanesque church, uh, Fountain Street Church, uh, Fountain Street Baptist Church at the time this was built. So he designed this building that looks kind of like a Romanesque palace. Um, the effect is uh, ruined a little bit by this addition, the squared addition that was stuck on top uh, in the uh, 60s or 70s. But here's a closer look at some of the sculpture on the building. You can see they added color to some of it. And one of the reasons I like it is uh, these two figures here, especially, uh, they remind me of the book Where the Wild Things Are. And I wonder if maybe uh, uh, Wirt Roland and Maurice Sendak and, um, for, or Ulysses Ritchie didn't all work from the same reference material. Uh, this building also has a very gruesome ghost story attached to it that um, we really don't have time to go into now, but it can, if you want to know more, it's on page 171 of the Guardians of Michigan book. And then we're going to finish up by looking at the uh, Ford Motor Company Engineering Laboratory, which is, uh, built in, was built in 1924 at 21500 Oakwood Boulevard in Dearborn. Architect again is Albert Kahn. Uh, work on the building, the sculptural work is attributed to Ulysses Ritchie. So the, the Ford Motor Company was established in 1903 on the basis of a motor car that Henry Ford developed working in his garage with one or two assistants. And by um, 20 years later, when the company broke ground for this building, this engineering laboratory, this was going to house 1,800 of the company's 100,000 employees. So you can see how fast the Ford Motor Company 
and the automobile manufacturing took off and built and grew during those 20 years. This has some very nice uh, high relief, very high relief sculpture, kind of unique for a building on the outside of it. Here's a closer look. On the north side of the building, you have these uh, kind of Greco-Roman goddess and god figures representing uh, commerce. You can see she's holding a caduceus again, and they're sitting on a Model T Ford uh, with an owl behind them, a protective owl providing wisdom. And then on the south side of the building, uh, representing agriculture, you have these two figures sitting on a Fordson tractor with the American Eagle protectively guarding them. And then uh, the Ford Motor Company also made aircraft and ships. So you have these figures representing aviation and sailing. And then uh, this statement over the entrance about the importance of the job that goes on inside. And then this figure here on the left, this is a closer look at that figure, so you can see just how almost totally released, what high relief these figures are in, how, how it's almost totally released from the background. And then you have a figure here representing wireless communications, another one representing pharmaceuticals, and another one re representing trucks and truck transportation and commerce. So that's going to wrap it up. I want to talk a little bit about the books, uh, Guardians of Detroit, is uh, 330 some pages, 750 photographs, uh, all buildings from inside the city limits of Detroit. Guardians of Michigan is 470 pages, 1,200 photographs, all buildings outside um, the, state, the city of Detroit. And as I mentioned, there's no overlap between the two. And if you're interested, whether you want to purchase a book or not, please come up, uh, take a look uh, after I finish up. If you have any questions that we don't get answered tonight, uh, you can visit guardiansofmichigan.com. That's the website for the books. And guardiansofmichigan at gmail.com if you want to email me and ask me any questions. Uh, I also do tours, and I have other events, and there's a schedule of events um, posted on the website. Thank you all for coming. I'll be here as... Um, Uh, be here to answer questions or, or to sell books if anybody's interested afterwards. <laughs>